Bug is a 2006 psychological horror directed by William Friedkin, best known for The French Connection and The Exorcist, with a screenplay by actor playwright Tracy Letts, based on his stage play of the same name. It tells the story of Agnes, a cocktail waitress at a gay bar in Oklahoma, living in a rundown motel, mourning the disappearance of her child and hiding from her abusive ex-boyfriend Jerry, who has recently been released from prison. One fateful night, her lesbian friend R.C. introduces her to Peter, a drifter recently discharged from the military whose mutual loneliness Agnes soon gravitates towards and they shortly become romantically involved. The two become stuck together after Jerry makes a surprise visit to the motel, assaults Agnes and swipes her money. Peter decides to stick around for her protection and the two passionately make love that night. Later, the two discover an infestation in their room, bugs which go unseen by the other characters and the audience, and Peter begins to unravel as he reveals that he's actually a deserter, going AWOL from the military because he believes that he was part of a series of undercover experiments by the government and worries that Agnes has become involved by proxy. This creates tension as Peter and Agnes insist on protecting themselves from the infestation, all the while the other characters remain unconvinced of the problem. Peter, exhibiting increasingly paranoid and conspiratorial thinking across the story, comes to the conclusion that the two are infested by the unseen parasites as part of a sinister plot by the government for inscrutable reasons, and the two begin to rapidly deteriorate into Peter's delusions as Agnes becomes more codependent on him, whilst pushing away everyone else who could possibly pull her out of this predicament. R.C. and Jerry involve a doctor with military connections who had been searching for Peter around town and offers Agnes the chance to finally find her missing son in exchange for giving up Peter to the government, who Peter almost immediately kills, claiming that he is merely a robot with synthetic blood. The climax eventually sees a state of shrieking hysteria when the two decide to burn themselves alive in their now tinfoil covered hotel room to stop further spread of the infestation. The film is an increasingly intense and layered 90 minute descent into paranoia and psychological decay, which won William Friedkin the Fipresky Prize at Cannes in 2006, where the film debuted. Now, for those of you who are of a squeamish disposition, squeamish, 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 yeah. I shall appease your fear by saying that it's not quite the horror movie that you're thinking of. I mean, the movie does involve a certain amount of body horror, but by and large, it's more so focused on the social and psychological decay of its principal characters. Bug originally made its debut as a stage play in 1996, and its reception, combined with that of Killer Joe, basically made Tracy Letts' career as a playwright worth paying attention to. For some cultural context, at the time that the play was conceived, the Unabomber, the Waco Siege and the Oklahoma City bombings were still pretty fresh in the American consciousness, and there was all kinds of underground conspiracy culture in the 90s that birthed things like The Matrix, The X-Files and the careers of both Alex Jones and David Icke. In the 90s, it was just somewhat popular and easy to accept that they, whoever they are, were up to something. So the environment the bug was entering into was just kind of perfect for exactly this kind of physical, raw, psychological storytelling. As a theatrical experience, it's a play that's really well designed for its own medium. It's a chamber piece, a trapped audience in a cramped room with characters slowly losing their minds and hurting themselves in a very intimate way that only theatre can really do exceptionally. You're stuck, ideally in a small room, watching a very personal disaster unfold. In a way, it's almost like a lab experiment gone haywire if you decide to interpret what's going on a certain way. It's for that reason that it's a very physically and mentally demanding piece from an acting perspective. Because of the way that the drama and tension gradually ramps up, you need to really know the material and what you're doing in order to make the piece escalate in a way that feels truly organic and terrifying. And that is often quite emotionally challenging to perform night after night in the context of a theatrical run. It's the hardest play I've ever done. It's very tautly constructed, it's very well written, and any extraneous beat just ruins the trajectory of the piece. And so I found it to be, you have to be very direct and very clean, uh, even though there's a lot of chaos seemingly in the show, it's actually quite finely wrought. This is what Roger Ebert in his review of the movie meant when he said that he was scared for the actors because of the kinds of performances that Bug, as a piece taken on the whole, gets out of its key players. 
Taken as a whole, Bug is a very psychologically violent piece that challenges audience with a tender romance that is deeply toxic within a headspace that becomes a crescendo of delirium and psychosis. It offers no real easy answers to the questions it raises any more than it ascribes meaning to the pain the characters inflict on themselves out of desperation, and that alone is disturbing and sticks with you after the curtains are drawn. It's ripe for punchy, powerful storytelling which ultimately lives and dies on the skill of the core actors and the focus of the direction. Now, if the challenge is that you're trying to recreate that type of crazed, disturbing, hysterical energy in a film production, you do the best thing possible. You get William Friedkin involved. William Friedkin is something of a figure within the American New Wave he rode in on in the 1970s. Notoriously headstrong and sometimes physically confrontational, he's a bit of a character to say the least. Prior to becoming a feature director, William Friedkin has a background in live television news and documentary, and would subsequently take this knowledge and experience into his film career, with his attitude as a filmmaker being to treat fiction with all the raw untheatricality of documentary. That's not to say that he doesn't have a sense of drama and style, in fact he takes a lot of his dramatic cues from Alfred Hitchcock, Howard Hawks and Orson Welles, all of whom he's described as personal heroes. It's just that unlike all of those, he's distinctly lacking a taste for any sort of overt showmanship or panache. So famously, the French Connection uses cinema verite techniques to create a real sense of place in telling the story, with particular attention paid to the procedural work of being a detective, the aggressive psychological makeup of its principal character, and the extremes to which Popeye McDoyle goes in order to get results. <laughs> This is also the aspect of The Exorcist that makes it such a powerful movie, because it's made by someone who simply does not fuck around with regard to the jeopardy presented by the subject. If demons are real, then this is the practical reality of the situation. This is what's at stake, and engaging in that kind of raw, naked terror is why The Exorcist has such a wallop even now. He famously said of The Exorcist that he wanted to tell a straight story from beginning to end with no crap -a -roo. This approach was his great innovation of the 1970s. As Mark Cousins puts it, he took genre cinema and slapped it up the face with realism. He actually once said that he felt like contemporary horror movies were more akin to violent comedies because of the way that they don't commit to the terror of the scenario. The point is, he's a straight-shooting, somewhat confrontational filmmaker. He's after your guts. He wants you to feel something. And just like Alfred Hitchcock before him, he's got this remarkable capacity to just cut through all the guff and unforced fully present real drama and tension. To that end, the brilliance of Bug is ultimately in its stark simplicity. Its bones are its beauty. The sense of decay in which people like Agnes and Peter unfortunately live, the swiftness with which people can get caught up in conspiratorial paranoia, and the resulting psychological crisis that subsequently follows. Something crucial to point out here, in terms of its dramatic construction, is that Bug's horror does not come from the paranoia of being in unknowable danger, or of parasites, but rather the danger of paranoia itself. Its core set piece is derived terror from how the characters react to the scenario rather than confirmation of the presence of real danger. And whenever possible, the film opts to not confirm that presence, as does the play. Peter rapidly deteriorating into a seizure isn't unnerving because we know the bugs are getting to him, it's because it's such an overtly violent and disturbing reaction to a danger which remains unconfirmed. Extending from that, one of the things that I really appreciate about Bug in its adaptation is the way in which the drama is taken seriously by the storytellers, whilst also being self-aware as to how all of this conspiracy nonsense sounds. I am the super mother bug! There is a strain of black humour that exists beneath the surface, which in a way makes the body horror all the more horrifying. Because whilst all of this is certainly silly and delusional, they are still tearing themselves to pieces because of it. And that's the real danger here. Not that there could actually be bugs beneath their skin implanted by them, but because of the very real spiralling self-harm that delusional paranoia causes. Whilst being absurd, it is still perfectly dangerous, and the film doesn't lose sight of that danger or empathy for the characters because of that. The centre of Bug is a love story of two lonesome strangers who get mutually wrapped up in love with each other and subsequently isolationism and psychosis. Bug, with its horror tone and tragic love story at its centre, is in many ways about the inherent terror of interpersonal relationships, how intimacy often means getting under each other's skin, and how becoming enraptured by another person is not unlike being invaded by a foreign body. 
In Dan Olson's analysis of Annihilation, one of the points that he made, which I loved that he brought up, is that there is something inherently scary about the nature of intimate relationships, the way in which we expose and sacrifice something of ourselves in being involved with someone. And Bug is kind of the perfect example of the negative consequences of that, how opening yourself up to others exposes your mutual anxieties and fears which become swapped and taken on board as their own. This is actually a dimension of relationships that Peter seems quite keenly aware of. You have a center, right? Like uh, a place inside of you that's that's just you that hasn't been spoiled. And I think it's really important to try and keep that space sacred in some sense, on some level. But sex or relationships cloud that space. Or they cloud me, I guess, and make it difficult to be just me and not have to worry about being somebody else. And given how the two characters end up at the end, he's not exactly wrong. In relationships, we become stuck to each other, the way that we change, mutate and reveal ourselves to each other as we become more intimate, and how sometimes we can end up in too deep. I think the thing that's interesting here is that this mutation of being seemingly isn't deliberate on Peter's part. Like, I don't believe that Peter is trying to cause Agnes to have a psychological crisis. He seems to care too much about her actual well-being for that to be the case. The two just gravitate towards each other in the way that normal people do, seeing something in each other that they like, and their interests merge together in protecting themselves from everyone else, with reality itself eventually becoming the enemy. This dynamic is partially based on a real psychological condition that Tracy Letts researched when originally conceiving the play. Folly adieu, or shared delusional disorder, where two or more patients convince themselves of the same core delusion through mutual contact. Though just to make a quick addendum here, this condition is not actually recognised in the current DSM-5 as the criteria is considered insubstantial, and there's internal debate within the medical community as to what point mere delusion turns into what you would call mass hysteria, but it works as a nice poetic metaphor as we see here. The point here is that when Agnes falls in love with Peter, she also falls into his reality, because without meaning to sound too clinical here, what is love if not being somewhat mildly delusional in your partner's favour? What helps all of this is that Ashley Judd and Michael Shannon have real chemistry as a screen couple, and whilst Shannon is the more experienced with this particular play, reprising a performance originally written for him, I feel like Judd quietly steals it from under his nose with beautifully layered moments like this. I lost him. He died. No, he disappeared. Really? Yeah, in the grocery store. None. Ten years ago now. How old was he? Six. Do you have any more questions? Because if you do ask him now, I don't want to talk about it again. The more that I watch the movie, the more that I empathise with Agnes as a character, in no small part because of Ashley Judd's performance here. I think that the tragedy of Agnes is that she's seeking a resolution to, or rather comfort from, losing her son all those years ago, and that there's no real meaning to be found in that. I spoke about this when we talked about Hereditary, in the way in which grief makes the cruelty of the world feel more deliberate than it really is because of the way that the mind tries to make sense. This is a subject that other movies like Don't Look Now mine for great drama. The loss of her child and the abusive instability she put up with from Jerry is deeply painful, with no clear answers up ahead, and this provides an opportunity for people like Peter, intentionally malicious or not, to be a comfort to her, to pry her open and flatter her with their ideas. That the best thing to happen in her life so far, hooking up with a sensitive, if otherwise anonymous, drifter, is not a coincidence. She's a vulnerable and very emotionally needy person, and it's this combination that makes her susceptible and responsive to Peter's ideas. Agnes doesn't really want Peter to leave, in part because he represents some kind of protection, should Jerry come back, but also because his erratic beliefs provide some kind of a meaning for her pain. She's unwilling to disagree or even really question the various webs of conspiracy that Peter has spun for the two of them out of fear of being abandoned. Given her straight flush of traumatic experiences, going back to being isolated and alone almost feels like a threat. Oh, you son of a bitch! And so, when doubt is in the air, when R.C. starts to actually question the things that Agnes should have questioned, and Peter asks Agnes, do we have bugs or not, 
It's essentially an ask of, do you trust me? And is a direct challenge to Agnes's loyalty, encouraging her to take a side, with the implicit threat of him deciding to leave if not being left unstated. And here's the thing, Agnes doesn't necessarily have to believe that the bugs are real for her to fall into accepting them as real. What drives her character is her need to keep Peter around, and for her to comfort his hysteria in order to do that. And for those that have ever been in a toxic, possibly abusive, one-sided relationship, you'll know that that's enough to convince yourself of other people's delusions. It's only when R.C. threatens to call the police and thus remove him from Agnes's life, combined with Peter having a seizure, that she ultimately turns on her, effectively kicking out the last person who could actually keep her out of harm's way. <gasps> who do you think you are? You come in here and try to take from me the one thing in the world I have! Why can't you just leave me with one thing? The pre-existing chaos of Agnes's life just makes far more sense when Peter is around to give it a framework. Corporations, the state, mass media, illegal government experimentation. And this is the core of why conspiracy movements are so dangerous, the way that they take people's sincerely held anxieties about their sense of place in the world and give it a form and structure which inevitably leads to oblivion. The plot being centred on the development of a love story is a fascinating kind of misdirection here, a rose that's hiding a deadly viper beneath it, because getting involved with Peter directly puts both of their lives in jeopardy, more so than any kind of possible government surveillance. Agnes's relationship with Peter is meant as a comparison to Jerry. Whilst one is overtly violent and predatory, the other simply allows them both to mutually collapse inward. Regardless, the toxicity of both is identical. He shows up in her life quickly and confidently and proceeds to isolate her socially, pushing away all doubters and making her dependent upon his decisions. Also, consider that Peter only starts to have his seizure when RC threatens to call the police. It's essentially a temper tantrum that insists upon his point of view, and his violent reaction to what's happening compels Agnes to turn on her only real friend. There's also something to be said for how Peter is afraid of big government, mass surveillance and authority, all the whilst showing up and imposing his isolationist worldview on Agnes in a way that ultimately leads to both of their deaths. A critical component of this is in the final act, where Dr. Sweet shows up and Agnes is given the opportunity to finally find her son and attain closure in exchange for Peter, the first real choice she's had since allowing a timid anonymous drifter to stay over, but then almost immediately has that choice taken away from her by Peter's actions. Then quickly followed by Peter getting Agnes to solve the puzzle, to take the various disparate broken pieces of her life and force them into agreement, to aggressively assemble the pieces into a framework that Peter has willfully provided. And in the end, the framework authors the conclusion. Agnes's monologue at the end is a rambling, breathless panic of smashing ideas together to create a coherent narrative that finishes in the darkest punchline that she is the super mother bug. I am the super mother bug! It's absurd and ridiculous, but it's also a tragic collapse into her final form as she takes on Peter's psychosis. And the kicker is that she isn't horrified by this revelation. She's fucking elated. This is the best news she has had recently. The psychological flattery of being the super mother bug has taken hold. The hole at the centre of her being has been filled by the revelation. There's that old chestnut from Alan Moore about how conspiracy theorists believe what they do because that is more comforting than the alternative, that we're all just ape people with individual wants and needs crashing together on a chaotic rock hurtling through space. Conspiracies are both flattering and tempting because even though they profess that powerful people are scheming to get more control, it still means that someone is still in control, somebody has an agenda, they have a plan. In a phrase, conspiracy is romantic. We are in many ways seduced by the answers we feel are right and or want to be true. It's a way of constructing meaning out of the chaos of our existence by exchanging actual, factual truths for spiritual ones. The characters are lonely and frightened of being alone, falling apart mentally and emotionally, and they want to matter, want reasons to feel important. The bugs and the conspiracy they imply, whilst horrifying, are a comfort, because it means that two anonymous, lonely, emotionally damaged, otherwise unremarkable people 
are the target of a great conspiracy, attention and surveillance, and are thus mutually remarkable. They are special, exceptional even, because of what the conspiracy indicates, and that type of psychologically satisfying flattery is what draws people in and keeps them hooked. Similar to being gaslit and love-bombed in an abusive relationship. It is a radicalisation pipeline, an anxious doom spiral that leads to only one conclusion. I think it's a bit cramped in here. much better. I wanted to make this video because we're still in the midst of a global pandemic and a couple of lockdowns have given me plenty of time to observe and think about how cults like anti-vax and QAnon have spread and proliferated across the internet within a couple of years and it's quite easy to make comparisons between that and what Bug depicts. And just to be clear, it's not an entirely one-to-one -one comparison. Bug was originally written in the 90s to address things like the Waco siege, the Oklahoma City bombings, the Gulf War. It was deeply contemporary, it couldn't have accurately predicted the future of Cambridge Analytica, Donald Trump's presidency, QAnon, and the Capitol insurrection at the tail end. And yet it does give one pause for thought, doesn't it? I do think though from the perspective of 1996, Bug did at least have some idea for what the future architecture for social discourse was going to look like. As various lanes of communication merge, there comes more opportunity for people to learn and share information, as well as misinformation. The future was always going to be just that much easier for people to learn of the legitimate horrors of what our governments have done in the name of safety and security, and subsequently that much easier for hucksters and grifters to use that anxiety as the bridge for their entirely fictional horrors. The difference between then and now is that these ideas don't show up in your town on the back of a pickup truck drifting from place to place looking for somewhere to crash. They show up on your Facebook feed from people who have got concerns about vaccines and trans people. I would also like to submit the very last minute point that it is perfectly reasonable to have healthy scepticism of people in power on what they're doing, especially given the state of the contemporary world. Wildfires are getting worse, climate change is real and is frighteningly close to the point of no return, at least according to contemporary reports. Russia invaded Ukraine whilst I was writing this video. We supposedly live in a post-truth world. All of this amongst growing wealth income inequality because capitalism is destroying the world. We live in an often chaotic world and it feels as though chaotic people have the advantage and it's on that basis that it's easy to just accept their worldview, to accept whatever target that they throw at you in order to satiate your own anxieties about what our governments are up to, as you and the conspirators are in a two lovers against the world kind of relationship. We do this to each other on a daily basis like all the time. We impress our thoughts and anxieties upon each other and we allow ourselves to be impressed upon because being open and empathetic is part of being human. And that very fact is awfully disconcerting. And so more than 20 years after the fact, Bug serves as a terrific warning, a reminder that more often than not, great harm comes from people and places that are very ordinary. <laughs>